Hi friends, thank you for joining us again for the ASP Stories weekend bonus episode. Join us on Mondays and Thursdays where we interview amazing guests where they share with us about their adventure sports and the amazing feats that they have done. But ASP Stories is where we get to listen in as authors read their adventure stories to us. So sit back with your hot cup of tea or coffee and kick off your adventure-filled weekend by listening in while we hear more from ASP Stories. This episode is sponsored in part by Kennedy Pet Food. You know your dog is the best part of your adventure, and a great way to keep him happy and healthy is by feeding him the best pet food. That's why you need to check out Canada Pet Food. Canada is an independent and family-owned pet food company who uses the same care and the same quality ingredients they want for their own pets when making their pet foods. Check out Canada.com slash podcast. The next series on ASP Stories will be from Annie Dyke. Annie has a blog at havewindwilltravel.com. Go check it out. You can also hear more from Annie on episodes 75 and episode 138 on the Adventure Sports Podcast. In this final ASP Stories episode from Annie Dyke, she reads chapter one from her third book, None Such Like It. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hi there, Annie here, salty writer, sailor, rum drinker, and dream chaser at HaveWhenWillTravel.com. I've been writing a blog at HaveWhenWillTravel.com. Uh, chronicling the adventures and more often misadventures of uh, my boyfriend and I on our 1985 Niagara 35. Lots of really cool articles, how-tos, how-not-tos, and photos and videos there for you, and links to my books. I have three uh, self-published sailing books, um, ranked number one on Amazon at one point in time. Uh, very fun stories, though, and feel free to go check them out. Today I'm going to read for you the prologue and chapter one of my third sailing book, None Such Like It, which uh, for any of you out there thinking about getting a boat or have a friend thinking about getting a boat, takes the reader on an enlightening voyage through the nine stages of boat buying grief, <laughs> because all boats eventually give us a heck of a lot of grief. So here we go. The prologue. It started with shock. Our buddy was so euphoric about the idea of owning his very own liveaboard sailboat, he envisioned himself aboard the only one in the world that simply could not sink. Through holes? Oh, hush. Nothing goes through my hole. I have to admit, when he first came to us with the idea, I was a little shocked myself. Mr. While you're down there with his very own boat? Anyone else I can understand, but this was Mitch, the man with such patterned and predictable requests for retrieval of provisions below he had earned himself the down there nickname. Mitch had squeezed and wiggled around our boat like a grown man in a McDonald's play place and often needed a bucket hanging from his neck to upchuck his Doritos. This man wants a boat? I'm not one to shoot a man's horse, but there are just some people, you know, and they can be very close friends, hearts of gold, good salt of the earth people, but you just know they should not own a boat. It's just not a good fit. Mitch can't sit still for five minutes. He cannot not ask questions anytime you do anything. What's that? Where does it go? Why are you turning it? He's got the best of intentions, but he's also got some sort of halo filter around his head that makes him perceive only his surroundings, only his emergencies. Patience is a, you can start to say, but he'll cut you off before you finish with a, hang on, hold this or move. I know all of this because Mitch was the third member of our rookie crew during the shakedown of all shakedowns, for us at least, in 2013 when Philip and I sailed our recently purchased 1985 Niagara 35 home from Putagorda, Florida to Pensacola across the Gulf of Mexico. Although I've been told along the edge of the Gulf is more accurate than across, it doesn't have quite the adventurous ring to it. And I'm stubborn, so consider them synonymous for purposes of this fine treatise. I also say rookie crew because there were so many things the three of us had not done or had not done together, which would have better prepared us for that passage. I, for one, had never sailed. Aside from a one-hour romp on another boat, Philip and I looked at before settling on the Niagara. That trip was the second sail of my entire life. That meant I had no sailing experience, no offshore experience, no experience to speak of at all. Everything was new to me. Sometimes I still wonder why Philip let me come along. Maybe to clean and cook? I would have been okay with that. While Mitch had some sailing experience, he had never been on an offshore passage, and he and Philip had never sailed together, nor had he sailed a boat like ours. 
While Philip was easily the most experienced of the three of us in handling a large sailboat, he had never captained a boat on an offshore passage and had never been on a passage this long before. And, as Philip repeatedly stressed, every boat is different. Meaning, no matter how much experience you may have, each time you step aboard a boat you've never sailed before, there is a learning curve. So the three of us, Philip, Mitch, and I, were sailing a boat we had never sailed before, with a crew that had never sailed together before, on a passage none of us had undertaken before. Nothing could go wrong, right? Wrong. Plenty did, and while I'm not sure I would want to, it all to play out the same way again, it did make for one hell of a story. And, at the beating heart of it was him, Mr. While You're Down There. He was easily the most colorful character on that trip, the loudest, too. And while Philip and I both will be forever grateful for his help in bringing our boat back home in mostly one piece, to be honest, the thought of Mitch with his own boat kind of frightened us. It's just such a huge commitment. It's a huge money pit. Plus, it's huge. The image of Mitch barreling up to our boat in some 30-plus foot tank shouting and trying to raft up gave me nightmares. Hang on! Hold this! Move! Then I woke to the sound of crunching fiberglass. But it did not matter how many times we tried to tell him. We just didn't think it would be the right move for him. Try a charter for the weekend, we told him. Don't jump right into this, we warned. It did not work. Mitch set his sights on a boat down in Fort Myers, put in an offer sight unseen, hit the road, and just went ahead and bought a boat while he was down there. Only Mitch. But Philip and I knew we had a debt to pay. Philip had stepped up. Mitch had stepped up when no one else had or could to help us bring our beautiful Niagara back from South Florida. So he knew we would step up and do the same for him when it came time to bring his own boat home across the Gulf. I knew, at the very least, it would make for one hell of a story with the colorful and charismatic Mitch now playing the role of captain. What I was not prepared for, however, was the enlightening journey Philip and I would embark on during the process with Mitch through the nine stages of his boat-buying grief. First, Mitch was in shock. Then he was angry. Other times he seemed to deny the whole thing ever happened, like he didn't just buy a magnificent, never-ending chore that needed to be stocked, cleaned, maintained, and repaired. For the first time, I started to see my dumb self experiencing each of those phases when Philip and I had purchased and began cruising our own boat just two years prior, and it dawned on me. I was Mitch once. You likely have been, too. Once you've made your own voyage through the stages, though, and accepted the fantastically frustrating reality of boat ownership, friends who seek to follow you down this seemingly insane path provide endless entertainment when their boats, as boats tend to do, start giving them plenty of grief. Chapter 1. Shock. The surreal belief that boats mean only fun. The affected's initial reaction may be numbness or a surreal sensation, as if what just happened did not, in fact, happen at all. He may feel as though he is not entirely present or emotionally attached to what is happening. We've all had it happen to a friend at one point or another. They see you have a boat. They come and hang out a time or two on your boat. They start asking you questions about maintenance, where you keep it, how much this costs, how much that costs. Then it happens. It's inevitable. Your friend gets bit. Now he wants a sailboat too. Then he drives you crazy. It's all he can think about, all he can talk about. He drives his wife mad. He spends every free minute, even to the early hours of the morning, poring over listings on Craigslist, Yacht World, broker sites, even eBay, trolling his fair share of quote-unquote boat porn. They should have a support group for the addicts. The hunt is consuming. Now, usually such a friend doesn't actually take the plunge. It's easy for him to shop, compare, research, ask a hundred questions, but when it comes time to actually choose a boat and put in an offer, most of these bitten friends find the urge is not quite strong enough. They talk a big game, but when it comes time to actually sign up with a broker and put in an offer, the urge wanes. But while they are seriously shopping, so they claim, and while you don't think this particular friend should really own a boat, so you claim, it's too tempting to not encourage them. Imagine the entertainment your mind teases. You can't help it. Do you allow your devilish intrigue to take over? Of course you should get one, Jim. Sailboats are awesome. They're fun 100% of the time, and they never give you problems, you say through a slick smile. Now, why do you say that? Because you've been there. You've been Jim, the googly-eyed boat-struck sucker who wouldn't listen to or heed any warnings. I'm getting a boat, darn it. And because you were that person, and you got a boat, darn it, and then realized, like everyone told you, that it was one of the most expensive, frustrating, fantastic things you've ever done, you can now kick back and settle into your new role as Jim's friend, the tried, tested, and proven boat owner, and get a little entertainment out of Jim's voyage down the same path. Even though you know he won't listen, you may try to wise your poor friend to the realities of boat ownership. Now, it's a lot of hard work, Jim. It's going to be very costly, especially in the beginning, but it will continue to allow, it will continue to always cost you more than you expected. 
It also requires a lot of time and labor. It needs to be your biggest time and money commitment. Are you sure you're ready for that? You might do the latter because you're a good person and you really care about Jim and his continued financial, mental, and marital stability. Or you might do it because you know if he does get a boat and it does in fact give him problems, shocker, the first person he's going to bring those problems to is you. But you've got your own boat, remember? Your own daily host of boat problems. You don't need his too. Sometimes though, no matter how hard you try to talk Jim out of it, ease him back from that ledge. He is inclined to take the plunge anyway. No matter how much you say it's going to cost him, he says with fake quotation marks and a snarl mocking you, he thinks he's ready. He's getting a boat, darn it. If that's the case, you might as well jump on the bandwagon and help him. You know, at the very least, it's going to be one hell of a show. That's where Philip and I were. After the three of us, Philip, Mitch, and I made the initial epic gulf crossing, bringing our Niagara 35 from Punta Gorda, Florida, to her home port in Pensacola. Mitch really did swear he would never get back on our boat with us again to cross anything. Anything, those were his words. And he didn't. Never again for a passage. But he did get on our boat again a time or two when we invited him and his family out for the occasional weekend to enjoy the brighter side of cruising. Life on the hook. Hourly dives off of the bow into crystal green waters, grilling burgers in the cockpit, eating dinner under a smattering of stars, falling asleep to the sound of the wind and water lapping at your hull. He kicked back on our deck, all Havana Day dreaming, and that's when it happened. It really was inevitable. Mitch got bit. He wanted a sailboat, too. Oh, boy. At first, Philip and I kind of scoffed at the idea and laughed it off. While Mitch is a good sailor, he is still, we knew from firsthand experience, a screamer, a slapper, and certainly a big person to fit on a little boat. Scratch that. Any boat. I had to wonder, though, if folks thought the same of me when Philip and I were boat shopping, and I couldn't tell you the bow from the stern, the mainsail from the jib, the anything from the anything else. I called lines ropes, for Christ's sake. When we found our beautiful Niagara down in Punta Gorda, Florida, the first thing I asked, all doe-eyed and innocent, was, when will they deliver the boat to us, Philip? I'm sure at that stage, I was the person my boating friends believed should never own a boat. To be honest, we simply didn't think Mitch's desire for a live-aboard sailboat would really come to fruition. At the time, he owned a little Sea Pearl 21. It was one of those sought-for-sale-on-the-side-of-the-road type deals he'd picked up for a steal, and it seemed to just be an experiment to see whether the family would like sailing, one I believe ended badly. The Pearl was very small, a trailable open-day sailor, and quite a rocky rolly boat for him and his family. I have yet to tip a sailboat, but this was the first one I really thought I might. He took Philip and me out in the Sea Pearl one sunny afternoon in Pensacola Bay right after he bought it, and as I suspected, there was plenty of, hang on, hold this, and move. Mitch was like an unpredictable rogue ballast. Anytime he moved from one side of the boat to the other, which he did often for no reason other than he's fidgety, the boat threatened to tip. If you didn't somehow lunge your body weight immediately to the other side of the boat, she would swamp on Mitch's side. And I say lunge your body weight because it was not a dainty procession. These were not the ginger steppings of a girl at her cotillion. This was more like a mosh pit. If Mitch made the slightest indication of a move, Philip and I would throw our torso toward the opposite rail and just lay for a minute until Mitch settled back. Now, won't this be perfect for the family? Mitch asked, a goofy grin pointed up towards the sails, completely unaware of the lunge and leap act Philip and I had been putting on. Philip and I were splayed out on the starboard side trying to hide our faces from him. Yeah, Mitch, just perfect. We weren't there for the inaugural test trial with the family aboard the Sea Pearl, but Mitch said when he took his wife, Michelle, out on the Pearl, she looked about as comfortable as a cat in the bathtub. His words. Apparently, when the family, not quite as trained on the wherever Mitch goes, go the opposite rule, darn near tipped the little skiff over. It was so traumatic for Michelle that she vowed to never set foot on a boat with Mitch again. But what about this? I could just hear him saying to Michelle in the face of her refusal. Even ever in the negotiator, he was somehow able to massage her ultimatum into an arrangement wherein she was never required to step aboard that boat again, the Sea Pearl. In return, Mitch got an agreement that she would step aboard a boat with him again, so long it was uh, as it was untippable. Her words. With that settled, there really was nothing else Mitch could do but embark on a hunt for a bigger, untippable boat. I think once he officially decided this is what he was going to do, buy a boat, that's when Mitch enters stage one. Dogs make the best partners for outdoor adventures. Good food keeps your dog happy and healthy for those big days. So feed your pets Canaday. Canaday is an independent and family-owned pet food company who uses the same care and the same quality ingredients they want for their own pets when making their pet foods. In keeping with their commitment to pets and their people, Canaday has taken the first steps at Canaday Farms to getting involved in growing the ingredients that they use. Go to Canaday.com slash podcast. 
to try Canaday for free by requesting a free sample, and you'll get other special offers too. That's C-A-N-I-D-A-E dot com slash podcast. Again, that's Canaday.com slash podcast. Check out bikeparts.com for all your cycling gear. They have a wide selection of over 60,000 bike parts and accessories. Need suggestions or have a question about what fits your bike? Their knowledgeable staff will answer any questions and get you rolling as quickly as possible. If you're in the great state of Colorado, stop by their full-service bike shop, Peak Cycles, in downtown Golden. That's bikeparts.com. As I'm sure you know from listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, some of the safest and best snow conditions for backcountry skiing of the whole year happen in the springtime. And Bentgate has the gear you need. Come check out the latest in Alpine Touring, Telemark, NTN, and Splitboarding gear. They have brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammut, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you do need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear. They have beacons, airbags, shovels, and probes, and they're ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. They also rent out gear, so you can get your skis and your boots there, as well as your avalanche safety equipment. What's more, they also have free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Now, how much fun does that sound? So swing by Bentgate in Golden, Colorado. Or go to bentgate.com to find your new gear, as well as to get updates on all of their events. While Philip and I agreed the Pearl was definitely the wrong boat for the 6'4 Roberts and his family, we were not yet convinced any boat would be, but Mitch had succumbed to the delirium. He sold the cute little rocky rolly boat and did what those bitten do, started scouring listings, shopping online until midnight, looking at boats and marinas around town. It was all he could think about, all he could talk about. Philip and I tried initially to talk him back from the ledge. It's a lot of work, buddy, a lot of work. I kept conjuring images of Mitch trying to execute what to him might be an impossible boat project. I saw him sticking arms and legs out of a lazarette, fumbling for a wayward screw in the bilge, rubber glove clad, dry heaving at the side of the treasures that awaited him in the holding tank, and it brought me back to my own ignorant euphoria and the many times Philip had tried to convey to me when we were, like Mitch, just toying with the idea of really buying a boat. Owning a boat is a lifestyle, Philip would tell me. If you really want to maximize it, it has to be the primary way you want to spend your money, your time, your money. And while he was right, I didn't truly get it when he said those things to me. I was focused on the more important task of choosing the captain's hat that looked best on me. Did I picture myself holed up in the engine room fighting a greasy steering cable? No. Could I envision myself trying to wiggle ass first into a lazarette? Heck no. I didn't even know what a lazarette was at the time. Now, were all of the projects and work and effort Philip tried to warn me about worse than I had imagined? Somewhat. But were they impossible? No. And they certainly snapped me out of my blissful this hat or that stage. I hoped this would turn out to be the same for Mitch because he was clearly in the same surreal state of mind. Every time he talked about getting a boat, he would, we would warn him again about how much it would cost, how much it would take to maintain, how hard it would be, how much it would cost, yes, again, but none of it stuck. Mitch waved us off time and again. Our words seemed to strike him like little pebbles and clatter uselessly to the floor. No matter how graphic or realistic our warnings, you may have to physically unclog the head. You may have to dole out three grand in a day. He had no emotional reaction to them. He was living in a surreal world where boats meant only fun. No matter what we said, Mitch persisted until finally his persistence won us over. It became clear Mitch was going hell or high water to get himself a boat. It was kind of inspiring, actually. Even in the face of such stern advice, it was like Mitch knew he wanted this. It seemed he needed it. We couldn't stop him, so we joined him. We might as well help him get a good one, Philip finally conceded, because you know we're going to be the first ones he'll call when stuff starts to break. And that was it. Philip and I were officially enlisted as Mitch's trusted boat counsel. Mitch's number one requirement, as it is with most folks in the market, was something affordable. That's usually the first and foremost. But his next item of importance was a boat that he could single hand. While his significant other is a sprite, attractive lady, a sailor she was not, nor did she express any desire to be, which is fine. It's not for everyone. And at 10 years old, Mitch's son, while he may someday become a great sailor, didn't yet have the knowledge or strength to truly help Mitch handle a boat. Initially, it would be Mitch manning the entire vessel himself. So his primary concern was a boat that was large enough to fit them all comfortably, including his sizable self, but that he could also handle and sail by himself. He also wanted a boat that was essentially turnkey, 
Just toss the lines and she's ready to go, he would say, which gave me a chuckle. Granted, there are many boats out there like that, but go for how much, I wanted to ask him, <laughs> and remind of his own stern line-in-the-sand budget, and go for how long, before you have to dole out some bucks for repairs. Usually when you first buy a boat, there's a list of initial upgrades, improvements, or repairs that you want to undertake right out of the gate to really make the boat your own. If they're not, which is rare, there is still the usual maintenance and upkeep ticker that is always going, and it would be hard to fathom any of those small or not-so-small projects hadn't reached its prime while the boat sat for sale. Oh, stop it, negative Nancy, Mitch would say with a whiff of his hand when I tried to tell him these things. Uh, no, try realistic Rita, I wanted to counter, but I would just hold my hands up in the air and shake my head. What more could I do? While I understood Mitch did not have the time, knowledge, or money to dump into a fixer-upper, and I would not want that for him, mostly because I would not want that, Mitch with a monster project for us, I was not sure he would be able to find a boat that would be ready to go, maintenance-free, for an entire season, within his price range. I won't disclose the specifics. Just know Mitch is a savvy negotiator and can strike some killer deals. I think it's his wily charm that wins folks over. And he had a vision for the type of boat he was confident he would be able to find within his very tight price range. I just found it was a tall order, that's all. But perhaps my Nancy was showing because the man was also lucky, irritatingly lucky. With the single-handed sailing requirement, one of the first boats Mitch considered was a nonsuch. It's a cat rig boat with a very simple setup. Think one big sail. Seriously, that's it. Once you hoist the sail, there's nothing more to do than trim it. How do you tack? You turn the wheel. That's all. The boat handles the rest. Philip and I were kind of intrigued by the idea. Just one sail? That must make it easy, right? We'll get back to that. It was, however, a hinterholer, the same make as our boat. So, of course, Philip and I gave Mitch a thumbs up there. And it was Hinterholer's flagship model. Compared to the number of none such as they produced, the Niagara's were a mere fraction. There's something to be taken away from that. If they weren't well received by the sailing public, they wouldn't keep making them, right? But it's not a very common boat, at least not around the Florida Panhandle. I had never seen one before. I would recall if I did. It looks awfully funny with that big tree trunk mast at the very front of the boat and no stays. Not a one. The huge hulky mass stands of its own accord, like a pine in the wind, and I had no idea initially that wishbone thingy could even qualify as a boom. We had yet to see a nun such sailing around in Pensacola. I was sure of that. You couldn't miss it or forget it if you did. The first sight of it from the pictures Mitch sent made me do a double take, but often so does Mitch, so I guess it was fitting. But because they were rare in our parts, Mitch struggled to find a nun such close to home to set foot on. Most of the ones he did find that were even worth a look were hundreds of miles away. For this reason, Mitch finally conceded to at least set foot on some other types of boats that were available for sale in our local marinas so he could start to get a feel for what might work for him. Granted, he did not yet have a physical feel for the nonsuch, but he had an intuition. In all of his boat buying process, Mitch stepped aboard exactly one other boat, a late 80s Hunter 34 located in Pensacola. It was a boat for sale in our marina, actually, so Mitch set up a look-see, real technical term in sailing, you look at the boat and see what you find, Curious about Mitch's intentions and probably wanting the entertainment of experiencing boat shopping through Mitch's eyes, Philip signed up for the look-see, and what he and Mitch found was Mitch didn't fit. The Hunter was a good boat, in good condition for its age, but Mitch literally hung head and shoulders off the V-berth bed. While this alone was a telltale sign, Mitch said overall the boat just didn't feel right for him. It is definitely a very subjective thing, whether you step on a boat and it, quote, feels right to you. I remember when Philip and I stepped aboard our Niagara, it was, I was so new to boats in general at the time, I wasn't even sure I knew what I personally was looking for. Philip mentioned the cockpit offered good bracing for healing, and I swear one of the first things that came to mind was a band of Baptist revivalists wedging themselves against the backrest while dousing someone in the cockpit floor with holy water. I tried to hide moments like that with a blank stare, but it soon kicked in. Oh, healing, as in leaning over. Got it. Even at that state of boat ignorance, though, I could tell the Niagara felt comfortable, warm, right. Philip and I were curious, though, what feeling Mitch was really aiming for. Build quality, comfort, seaworthiness, decor. We had no way to know, and for someone new to live aboard boats, it's often hard to know what characteristics of a boat will be important to you, or what ones you thought would be important turn out to be irrelevant. I've met people boat shopping who say the number one factor they want in a boat is air conditioning. You might laugh because that characteristic is not even exclusive to a boat. If you want AC, go buy a condo, you may scoff. But what about comfort? That is definitely something you want in a boat. And that characteristic is not boat specific either. Having met many people in the market for a boat, I have found whatever people believe they want in a boat will drive their search. 
Whether it turns out to be something that is actually important to them later or not, it's hard to say. You can't really talk them out of what they think will they will like, though, even if it is three heads and two AC units. That was definitely the case for Mitch. For whatever reason, all roads kept leading him back to the Nunsuch. He had a firm belief it would be the right boat for him. Philip and I knew very little about the Nunsuch, but seeing as how it was a hinterholer, we didn't give it the negative Nancy no. We knew, at the very least, it would be a good build quality and a dependable boat for our insatiable new sailboat buddy. I guess if you could call boat shopping online looking at boat porn, it seemed Mitch had developed a rare, untreatable Nunsuch fetish. He searched high and low and finally found one down in Fort Myers, Florida, suitable driving range from Pensacola that had been on the market for quite some time. It was a 1985, like ours as well, I know, kind of eerie, but it appeared to be in good condition. The man who owned it sailed often, reportedly all systems worked, no big repairs, overhauls, or major modifications were needed. The sailing broker told Mitch the boat was just as it appeared in the photos, which, minus a little elbow grease and simply green, was astonishingly good. The selling broker also told told Mitch the owner was motivated. That's where he went wrong. While Mitch is quite the character, entertaining, comical at times, loud and impulsive, he is also a born salesman. He's so enigmatic, such a dominating, vibrant personality, you can't really work your way around him. After a while, you just give in. I wouldn't even use those tired ice to Eskimos or catch up to a white gloved lady lines. No, Mitch could sell you the sweaty, oversized tank top off his back and soon have you selling the rest of his soppy shirts on commission. He's that good. With the word motivated, Mitch was motivated. He put in an offer for half the asking price. Yes, half. I was annoyed at the thought of it. I won't even tell you the asking price, so you won't have to be annoyed by it either. I mentioned the irritatingly lucky part. But it made Philip and me a little skeptical. Why would such a good boat, according to the pictures, in such great condition, according to the broker, go for such a great price? It seemed a little too good to be true. Not to Mitch, though. I was surprised he wasn't more worried or scared. He seemed numb to the fact that he had just legally obligated himself to buy a boat that might be half sunk. I couldn't not imagine Mitch walking up to his too-good-to-be-true nunsuch and finding it half full of water, that big sail only a shredded, tattered remain, and the water line sitting right above the tow rail on the outside. I could hear the gurgle as he walked up. Apparently, that's not the sight Mitch had in his mind, though, because he did it. An old nunsuch sitting down in Fort Myers and Mitch... While you're down there, Roberts, in a state of blissfully ignorant shock, puts in an offer, sight unseen. All right, thanks for listening to today's ASP Stories with Annie Dyke. That will be her last reading. Make sure you get over to visit her at her blog and YouTube channel at Have Win Will Travel. You can also hear her interviews on ASP on episodes 75 and 138. Our next series coming up for ASP Stories will be Nancy Pfeiffer. She'll be reading from her book, Riding into the Heart of Patagonia. Until the next time, make sure you have a great weekend and get out there and have some fun.